Raspberry Hibiscus. Hello, dudes, dudettes, duders, and everyone in between, and welcome to How to Do Everything So You Don't Have To. I'm your host, Jesse Kester. This video is for all the low-budget multicam broadcasters out there. One of the side effects of being a low-budget multicam broadcaster is that you don't always get to work with the cameras you want to work with, and you can find yourself trying to match different cameras that look very, very different on screen. And we're going to tell you how to do that. And we're not going to be doing this in post-production. We're not even going to be doing this during physical production. We're going to do all of our camera matching in pre-production. Let's get into it so that you can get back to making movies. The techniques involved in this are actually really simple. What we're going to do is shoot a color card under identical lighting conditions with all of our cameras. We'll load that footage into DaVinci Resolve, and using the difference composite mode, we'll get those color cards looking identical. We'll export those LUTs, load them into our cameras, and then when we shoot, they should all match just perfectly. For the A camera, you're going to want something that can ingest LUTs. In this case, we're using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K, but this tutorial would be basically the same for the 4K, the 6K, or the 6K Pro. As long as your camera can load LUTs, you can do the techniques in this tutorial. For the B camera, we're using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema OG, the latest addition to our library of cameras. Welcome to the team, good buddy. You're also going to need a color card and an SD card for moving the LUT from your computer to your camera, and you're going to need a copy of DaVinci Resolve. If you've got all that, let's get over to that computer. We've already shot our color card and loaded it into DaVinci Resolve. What you're looking at here is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K, and underneath that video track is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema OG, and you can see that they are fairly different in how they interpret colors. There's a pair of very powerful tools you'll need to be acquainted with in the Colors tab to do this tutorial correctly. Curves and Scopes. The Curves has a histogram built in that gives you a readout of the image information as it goes into your color correction chain. Scopes gives you a waveform readout of your final image as it leaves the color correction chain. Let me show you what I mean by that. If we were to move this curve up and down, you'd see that the scope is being affected, but the histogram in our Curves window is not. That's because the image going in isn't changing. This is changing the image on the way out. So what we're going to do is a very extreme correction that is instantly noticeable on the scopes, but nothing has changed in the curves. But if we were to create a new node by adding a serial node after that one, you will see that our histogram has changed completely. It's loaded the image coming into this node. If we go back to node 1, you'll see the histogram for the image loaded into node 1. We won't be getting into nodes in this tutorial, but I wanted to demonstrate the difference between the histogram and the scopes. Now let's learn how to read both of these. You'll see a couple of spikes over on the curves, and we're going to put some handles on those spikes so that we can affect them. We've got one down here, and this one is representing the black strip. We've got a really, really obvious spike right here, and that's our middle gray. And up at the top, we've got another spike, and that's representing our white strip. Now if we were to adjust these, you'll see that the white strip is being adjusted a lot, and nothing else is being affected. If we go to the middle gray, you'll see that we're affecting middle gray, but not much anywhere else. And if we go to the black one, you'll see that it's affecting the blacks of the image, but not much else. Let's reset that and put our handles back on those three curves, because we will be adjusting those curves momentarily. Now we have a black strip, a middle gray strip, and a white strip, and those are represented over here on our waveform. You'll see the white is here, middle gray is here, and black is here. Now watch those move as I adjust the handle. We're just affecting the white strip, now we are mainly focused on the middle gray, and now we are affecting the black strip. So that's how to read your waveform and how to read your curves window. Let's reset those and go back to our editing tab. Now that we understand the tools involved, we're going to get started on the process of making these two shots match. And to do that, we're going to select the 4K footage, load the inspector, and switch the composite mode from normal to difference. And when you're in difference composite mode, pixels that are different will be retained, and pixels that are similar will fade into this black color. We are going to be doing this in a specific order. We're going to correct the grays first, then we're going to do red, green, and blue, and then we're going to do yellow, cyan, and magenta. And there's a reason we do it in that order, and we'll explain the reason as we go. But we're not going to be doing this blind. 
what we're going to do is go over to the media pool and load up a stencil that I built. And this stencil is very, very simple. It is just a mostly black image with a square in the center that is transparent. I'm going to turn off the 4K footage so that you can see a little bit more clearly what's going on here. The stencil will let us isolate color squares just like that. We can move it up and down and we can move it left and right. We can take it over to the gray strips. There's black, there's middle gray, and there's white. So that once we get into the color tab, we don't have to worry about all that other information. This is what our scopes looks like with that stencil on. And when we turn it off, we are flooded with lots of information that isn't necessary for the correction. So let's turn that stencil on and leave it on middle gray. And I'm going to turn the 4K footage back on. And now we'll go over to the color tab and start getting this middle gray to match. When you get to the color tab, DaVinci Resolve will automatically select the top layer in your timeline. And in this case, that's the PNG stencil. We don't want to be working with that one. We want to be using the Blackmagic RAW 4K footage. And you'll know that that is selected when you see the histogram pop up. The PNG has a very, very minimal histogram, but the Blackmagic RAW footage has a lot of information. Let's go ahead and add some handles to the black, middle gray, and white. And then I want to direct your attention over to the scopes. Because what we're seeing right here is the information for this little square and only that little square. Let's zoom in a little bit so that we can see this more clearly. You zoom by holding down Alt and scrolling your mouse wheel to get zoomed in. And what we want to do is get this completely at the bottom of the line. And that's the middle gray, so let's, let's see what we can do. As I move that up, it's going up, and as I move it down, it's going down. Let's get that right about there. That's not bad. Not perfect, but certainly not bad. Let's move the square over to the white strip and start working on that one. And straight away you'll see that the white is quite a bit different. Again, we've selected the ping, so we have to go over to our Black Magic Raw. And now we can affect the white strip. And you'll see that as I move this down, the scopes are going up. And that's because the scopes aren't moving up and down with the handle. They're moving up and down with the similarity between the two layers. So as they get more similar, the scopes will go down into blackness. And as they get more different, they will go up into a lighter color. Now, if we were to move this past that bottom, we can continue to go up and you'll see that the scopes go up. So it's really, it's, it's representing a relationship between the two layers, not a color. And we've got that one pretty clean. All right, let's move that stencil over to the black. And the blacks are very different. So this will probably take a good minute. Let's grab those. Oh, we got to find that. So we're scrolling left and right there. And let's get that black to match, and we're going to have to move that a lot. All right, you can see that we've built quite a dramatic curve to represent those three, the black, the middle gray, and the white. But let's go back to our timeline and see how well these match now. And to do that, we're going to turn off difference blending, and then we'll switch between the two layers. So that's the 4K, and that's the OG. And as you can tell, the black, gray, and white match very, very well. But if you look over to the colors, those don't match at all. Brightness and saturation are completely different. So now we're going to get into the red, blue, and green color spaces. And we're doing red, blue, and green first because those are the colors that the camera is most sensitive to and most accurate with. Yellow, magenta, and cyan are built from combinations of red, green, and blue because all you have are red, green, and blue sensors on your camera and all your monitor can display are red, green, and blue pixels. Let's get into the red first. So we're going to turn our stencil back on and move that over. Whoops, that was the 4K footage. We're going to move that stencil over to the red swatch. And what I've done is I've turned off the 4K footage so that we can get a clear bead on where that red is. Because when the 4K is on, it becomes uh, just black. All right, so now we have the stencil on. We have the Blackmagic 4K footage on and set to difference. And we are fixed on the red swatch. Let's go to the color tab and correct it. Things are going to be a little bit different over here because we're not dealing just with the Luma curve. We're dealing with saturation 
and brightness. So we're going to go over to our hue versus saturation and create handles for the red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and magenta. And we're going to do the same thing for hue versus luma, red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and magenta. And we're going to load up our scopes. And what we need to do is get these three different colors lined up, and then we need to smash them all to the bottom of this line. So let's go over to hue versus saturation, and we're dealing with red. So let's adjust the red to get those closer together. Now we're going to go to hue versus luma and adjust the red luminance and see if we can't get that buried. That's looking pretty good. Moving back over to our edit tab, we're going to turn off the 4K, move our stencil down to the blue swatch, and do the exact same process. Make sure when you get back to switch it to Black Magic Raw, go to your blue handle, and try to get those as similar as you can. It's being a... whoops! I often do this, I start in the hue versus luma, but we should have been over in the hue versus saturation, because we want to get these three fairly lined up. Back to hue versus luma, and see if we can't smash those down. And that's looking pretty good. We've got the blues desaturated and a little bit brighter. One more, and then we will speed things up, turning off the 4K so that we can move our stencil around. Find that green swatch, turning the 4K back on so we are doing a difference read between the two layers. And back to the color tab, make sure you've got Black Magic Raw selected and start with hue versus saturation. And let's affect that green saturation. Apparently that needed a lot of desaturation. Hue versus luma, and we should fairly easily be able to smash this information into the floor. Now that you understand the process, we're going to fast forward through the cyan, yellow, and magenta, and then we'll round this tutorial out. All right, we've corrected our blacks, our middle grays, our whites, our reds, our greens, our blues, our yellows, our magentas, and our cyans. Let's turn off that stencil and take a look at our results. So to do that, we turn off the stencil layer, then we go and we switch our 4K from difference to normal, and now as we turn on and off the 4K footage, we should be able to see that they are very similar. That is nearly identical. If you look at the, the skin tones, they aren't perfect. The color swatches and the black, middle gray, and white are looking really good. The skin tones aren't perfect, and if you wanted to spend more time on this, you certainly could, and you could get them to match beautifully, I'm sure. But this is good enough for now. What we're going to do is export that LUT and put it into our Blackmagic camera. Exporting LUTs in DaVinci Resolve is super easy. All you have to do is right-click the footage, and make sure you're right-clicking the Blackmagic Pocket 4K and not the OG, because we didn't do anything to the OG. There is no LUT on the OG. It would be an absolutely flat LUT, but we do have one on the 4K footage, and you can see because we've got our little curves down there showing that we've made changes. Right-click that 4K footage, go to Generate LUT, and go to 33-point cube. Now, you do not want the 65-point cube because the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras can't load a 65-point cube. So go to the 33-point cube, and then, much like the childlike empress in The NeverEnding Story, we have to give this LUT a name, so of course that name will be Moonchild! If you are a responsible filmmaker, I will trust you to make a name that is better, more indicative of the LUT that you have created than Moonchild, but this is a tutorial, and I want to have a little bit of fun. Thank you very much. We save that. Now, getting it onto your Blackmagic camera does not involve any alchemy. You copy that LUT to an SD card, and then you put your SD card into the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K camera. Loading LUTs onto the Blackmagic Pocket 4K is super easy. Just slide that card in and close the card door. Tap the hamburger menu button and go over to LUTs. Down at the bottom, you'll see a back and forth arrow, and that's what you tap to ingest a new LUT. Import LUT and tap Import. Go over to your SD card and find Moonchild, then import it. Once it's imported, don't forget to turn the LUT on, and you do that by tapping the LUT and then tapping the check mark. And now you're ready to shoot. 
We've shot some footage and loaded it into DaVinci Resolve, and what you'll see is the Blackmagic 4K on the top video track and the OG on the bottom video track, and straight away, these two clips are very different, but that's because the LUT hasn't been turned on for the RAW footage. To turn it on, we go over to the Color tab, make sure we have selected the Blackmagic RAW clip, go to the Camera RAW settings, switch it from Project to Clip, and apply the LUT. Now you'll see those two clips match beautifully. And that pretty much covers it. You'll see that the techniques involved are really simple, but being able to match multiple cameras across one video switchboard and to make them match in pre-production is a very powerful tool indeed. This was not my idea. I got this idea from Alex Lindsay over at Office Hours, and I highly recommend that you check out their YouTube channel if you are into video production, live events, things like that. Of course, you're allowed to check out this channel, and you know how to do that with the subscribes and the comments and all that nonsense. Don't do it for me. Do it for other people who might find this content valuable and useful. Other than that, there's really nothing to say. Thank you so much for watching. Now, please get back to making some movies. Bye.